Welcome to Start of Grind. Uh, it's my real pleasure to introduce you, Nenad Paunovic, organizer of Belgrade Adventure Forum, core founder of Seven, uh, seven uh, Serbian Venture Network, uh, director of Edge, and president of Kutruli Alumni Club. Hi, Nenad. Hi. Nenad, uh, in Start of the Grind, we like to uh, talk about some personal notes. And I would like to ask you, what was little Nana like? In today's terms, they might say ADHD, <laughs> with uh, not very large attention span, always active, always curious, and curious to this day, always asking a lot of questions. So I can imagine that my parents had a really tough time raising me with all those que questions and curiosity about everything. Okay, tell me, I'm not going to ask you many questions, you're going to speak for yourself, but tell me, where were you born and where did you attend your elementary school and uh, high school faculty? Uh, I am from Belgrade, from uh, actually New Belgrade, uh, and uh, then I, I did live in, in several famous areas of Belgrade for some time, so I spent two years in Dorchol, two years in Senjak, very, very near to Dedinje, but came back to to New Belgrade, where I finished elementary school, finished uh, ninth gymnasium high school, and at at those times when I when I was in in high school, that was like early mid nineties, and then the the gasoline was not a very common thing in, in Belgrade, so it was very uh, convenient to have a, a school like three hundred meters from your home. So that's that's where I. I finished those and uh, then I enrolled the uh, Faculty of Organizational Sciences in Belgrade University. I uh, finished that. Uh, the uh, Studies of management. management. Yes, general, general management actually. And uh, then I, I recently finished executive MBA program on uh, Kutruli Business School. And became a president of Alumni Club. Uh, yeah, a little bit later. later. Yeah. Okay, okay. Tell me then that, um, uh, what about your career after you finish your schools, um, school and um, about about some your first job or something? How did your career went and what were your aspirations when you finished your faculty? Uh, well, I started wor working fairly early on, so I uh, finished high school and enrolled in the university in 1996. And then I joined ISEC, one of the first things that they, that they did. So these were the these were first uh, real practical experiences in, in doing business. But it was great that it was business, but it was not actually a business, not very, very real money involved. But we did learn a lot about leadership, about teamwork, about sales, about project management organizations, and that's really, really useful experience for later. And as early as 1998, meaning when I was 21 years old, I started working as a sales rep in then uh, young and upcoming company called Halloglasi. Might be called a startup in these days, but then we didn't have a startup. <laughs> Work here, and uh, so I wanted to 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 know to do something, to have something that what no matter whatever happens, I could always have a job, I could always do something, so sales is some kind of classic, uh, always always needed professions, so I wanted to, to, to learn how to do that. So actually I was a, a salesman, and uh, then, that was in 1998, and a couple of months after I started, there was the, the famous bombing and the so-called war here, so we did have kind of a pause there of a couple of months. And there, there's a silly anecdote from, from that time when I, a um, couple of days before the war, uh, Hal Oglasi published a new edition of the magazine. And that new edition had like big advertising space on, on the covers. So like two days before the war, I sold one of those big cover spaces to a Chinese company. And they paid money and then there was bombing and of course everything stopped. And three months later when we, when we started working again, he was very pissed off about why, why did, didn't we honor our agreement and publish the magazine when he paid for it 
So I said, sorry, okay, it's my first war, so we are just going to do it so else. <laughs> great, great. Next, next time I do better, but hopefully there won't be next time. That should be in contract, like major force. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so war is in closure. So like we did not honor the contract, and he was actually right. Yes, nice. So basically your first job was a job, a job at sales. And, uh, uh, actually, yes. Yeah, yeah. This, I, I suppose that is the hardest job, and the hardest job to learn, and that's like fire experience that create most of entrepreneurs. <laughs> well, basically sales is about communicating with people and yes. communicating value and providing value to people. Yeah. So if you have something great to offer, which if you don't, you shouldn't be doing that in the first mm -hmm. place, but if you have something great to offer, then your job is to uh, explain people how, can, how they can benefit from, from your offer and actually provide them value which means you're doing something good for people. They should be better off after using your service than, than if they miss it. So basically you are doing the service to those people that you're selling to. And it helps brush uh, communication skills, people skills, organizational skills. And it's a great overall thing to, to know and it is extremely useful in, in entrepreneurship. Yes, definitely. Um, thinking of that, um, could it be that that, that things defined your uh, your company in 2005 um, those values that you just spoke about the giving the value to the customers and giving those uh, um, um, I would say I would say not appropriate <laughs> skill set for the Serbian market was that something something that your company was based on or that was the idea for entrepreneurship uh, path of yours <coughs> well uh there is also a story about running my, uh, about uh, establishing Edge as a, as a company or a training business in Serbia because at that time, that was like 2005, uh, there was a, a, let's say, upcoming wave of public relations services. And public relations is a profession and that, that was something that was fairly new at, at that time. And a friend of mine and I were, I was doing at that time, I was director of clipping services in Slovenia and uh, actually they're in several countries, but um, company, they are communications company, they have peer services, advertising and clipping services, and I was director of clipping services in Belgrade. Uh, led the team of uh, more than 50 people at the time. And I was very close to PR, but I was not in the PR, but my friend was very much in the PR and he was very passionate about PR. He learned everything he could for 10 years at that time and he knew like more than most of PRs even know today. And he, he was very nervous about how little people know. And I was like sick of his rants about how nobody knows anything. And I said, okay, if you're so smart, why don't you learn? Why don't you teach them? He said, they won't come. And I said, okay, I'll bring them. So we basically uh, decided to organize a training yeah. and see if, if we can do something with it. We called several other uh, lecturers people who, who gave their experiences and we organized the first training, we announced it and we were like if we can gather 20 people that would be fantastic and with 30 people it would be great. Uh, the first seminar was in, in Aero Club in, in Uzumirko and uh, then people just started calling and at the end people were uh, people we know were begging like us like Prekoveze okay. <laughs> to, 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 to take more people in the in the training and we ended up with 40 people so full capacity absolutely full nice. capacity of the of that venue and uh, two months later we did uh, we tried to, to repeat that and we got 70 people that time because the, the first batch was I guess satisfied so that was the start of, of that business then we obviously continue to, to do trainings in, in different areas of so first PR, then marketing, negotiations, skills, uh, innovation, things like that. But there is another thing in, in my business. I have more than 20 years of, of business experience yes. now, but I never worked with physical goods, ever. Okay. It, it's, it's really strange because I, I, I know about your really large portfolio, portfolio and you're working with a lot of companies. So yeah, I, uh, I have worked with uh, several hundred companies yes, from yes. more than several dozens of, of different industries. And if you almost randomly mention a company here in Serbia, <laughs> there is a good chance that I've done something okay. with them in one of my positions, one of my heads. 
but I have never personally worked with, with physical goods. I have lots of clients that are producers, yes, distributors, logistics, things like that, but I, I don't want to have anything with stocks, with out of stock situations, with moving physical okay. goods, logistics, things like that. But tell me one thing, you didn't sell lemonade, you didn't own the lemonade stand like no. every entrepreneur, no? No. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> this is really great. I sold trainings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Because I have a passion in knowledge, and uh, yes. in my free time I learn professional stuff and things, and I, I read uh, autobiographies, I, I read business books, articles, so my business and my passion are almost very similar, one, one and the same, so I can talk about business, business growth, innovation, strategies, one great passion of mine, business models, things like that. So I'm, I'm passionate to, to give that knowledge and to share that knowledge, uh, whether it comes from me or from other people that, that have knowledge to be shared. So that's where Edge came from, that's where Bag Adventure Forum came from, and many other endeavors. I was also involved in um, another great festival that I'm very, very sorry that is not uh, not in Belgrade anymore, uh, that's called Belgrade Design Week, which is the, yes. the largest yes. design and creativity festival from Istanbul to Milan for, the, the, for Southeast Europe. And this festival actually brought to Belgrade, to us, uh, creme de la creme of, of the, the world's architects, designers, graphic designers, branding experts from top branding companies in the world. And we did have uh, Really, we were honored to, to have those people there for five days in Belgrade any, every year. And as, as the founder once said, when you, when you listen to Belgrade Design Week for a couple of days, your brain grows for 10 centimeters. So actually, it was a really fantastic experience. And we're trying to basically do something like that in a bit uh, different area with Belgrade Venture Forum to bring globally relevant people to share their experiences, share their knowledge, uh, give feedback to our entrepreneurs, to, to our pitching companies, uh, do business in this region, maybe we might somehow convince them to do business in this region, because we have to realize that we are extremely small region. Uh, aside from US, China, Brazil, Russia, England, even Germany is not among the largest. <laughs> And then, aside from all those, there is some kind of Balkan region split into 10 countries. And that makes absolutely no business sense. So we do try to make Belgrade center of Balkan region and center of business in, in this region, because Belgrade was that before the war, actually. A lot of companies did have their <coughs> southeast headquarters in Belgrade. And then when the war became, they, they switched those to, to Bucharest or to, to Budapest. Now, several companies have their headquarters, regional headquarters in Zagreb, but we actually firmly believe that Belgrade should be the center of entrepreneurship, knowledge-based businesses, uh, businesses as a whole in this, in this region. And to say to foreigners, okay, if you are even remotely interested in this region, and if you want to come at least once to, to, to see what's happening here, Please come to Belgrade Venture Forum, and we will do our best to, to make it worth it for you. Yes, you have uh, multiple contacts um, during the, your previous uh, previous engagements. So, um, what can we expect in, in Belgrade Venture Forum? Uh, would it be like <laughs> wide? Um, would it be like eyes opening? Would our uh, brain grow five centimeters? Six? At least. <laughs> At least. <laughs> <laughs> At least we try to do that because uh, we try to make a mix of. Serbian regional and truly global entrepreneurs and we will have uh, for instance a guy who is serial entrepreneur but that will mean something in, in US okay. he was uh, up until recently CEO of Telesign that has a couple of hundreds of people here in Belgrade employed uh, he will speak at the forum we will have uh, a lady who is a New Yorker She's a New Yorker uh, entrepreneur that has a company actually development in Belgrade. And their company uh, called TTI, or Take the Interview, uh, was used by Olympic Committee for hiring volunteers for Olympic Games in Rio this year. And uh, they received an investment from a Turkish investment fund. So the two of them meet in Belgrade, actually. 
and uh, both the Turkish investor and she will be at, at Belgrade Venture Forum sharing, sharing their experiences. Nice. And many, many others. We, are, we hope to, uh, to bring uh, top managers and or uh, founders of some, let's say, household names, but truly really famous companies, global important companies to, to bring them to Belgrade. And that would be a great success because every time some global important person decides to come to Belgrade, I really feel that is a, is a great success of all of us, because we are really tiny, very tiny, <laughs> and not so important globally. And uh, we did, we were lucky to have, uh, for instance, investment director of Intel Capital, the, the fund of 2 billion euros. I mean, you really need to, to work really hard to spend 2 billion euros. <laughs> and uh, we did have, um, uh, from from Israel, which is the, the startup nation and technologically extremely advanced nation, uh, we did have a chief science officer that, that works for the government, for, for responsible for the science of the company, and many other people, as founder of Russian fund of 200 million euros, partner in uh, the largest VC fund in Israel, president of Italian Business Angels Network, and people like that, and we do want to, to, to make those con connections between foreigners and local people because from my own experience, I know that just talking to those people for 10 minutes can really change your life and your worldview and expand your horizons enormously and really can be fundamental for, for development and <coughs> really important for, for this community here. Of course, um, as, you, as you mentioned, um, as, as we know that you're a person with a, with a lot of interests. Uh, I would say, I would ask you, uh, how do you make those, those contacts? Was that something throughout years or through your activities? Since you mentioned sport now, and uh, I know that you ran the Belgrade <coughs> Marathon as well, and that you have a like, really uh, fulfilled life. Well, I, I, I wanted to do something impossible. So it's really good to, to do something impossible at least once. So then you have a completely different look at the boundaries and what's possible, what's not, things like that. And running 42 kilometers, like without stopping, without yeah. even walking, uh, is really a, a great challenge. So I did train for that. I am extremely lucky that one of my best friends uh, is very, very good sports trainer, professional trainer. And there is another story to that because he's, he's really a great leader and uh, I did, uh, did manage to, to run the full marathon and the, the whole process of preparations and training for that, it's not the, the race itself, it's like four hours, but the, the process of training is at least one year or, or more and then you have to go to train when there is a meter of snow, when there is heavy rain, when it's extremely cold or extremely hot or any other you're extremely tired you're not feeling like training but you have a training plan and you need to do that and you need to be persistent and somewhere in a distant horizon <laughs> you hope that within a year on that day you will be healthy and motivated and really in a shape to to run that and it's not it was not just to run it it was to run it below four hours so that was my it was below it was my goal it was Three yeah, hours, 58, 58 minutes yeah. and yes. 19 <laughs> seconds, so it was really close. Really. But it was really, really a transformative experience in, in my life. And uh, regarding connections, it's a bit similar because you need to work hard without knowing what will happen. Because when we were training for my marathon, the, the, my friend and I were training together. But he went to ski a couple of weeks before uh, Belgrade Marathon and he got injured. So he couldn't run that race. So the whole year was not, did not materialize that year. And that's, that, that's like in, in, in business, in entrepreneurship, in any business in there. Is, uh, people often ask me about the Venture Forum, what is it going to be like? How is it going to be successful? I don't know. I have no idea. Every year I just do my best. We do the hardest work. And we'll see. Whatever happens, the important thing, I believe, is to say I gave my best. It was the best we could at that moment. And whatever happens, will happen. Yes, you trained for a year and you gave your best effort. And and, and then we'll see what happens. And we'll sometimes what happens. great things happen, sometimes not. You never know. 
sometimes it's below four and sometimes it's way up four billion or something. <laughs> <laughs> something like that, yes. But tell me one thing. Um, uh, I actually the... lived in a billionaire age, you know, in okay. 1992, 93. We were yes, all billionaires yes. in dinner, so yes. I had that feeling yes, of yeah. a, a bill of a couple of billion something. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. Uh, that was because the crowd, uh, the crowd uh, is into entrepreneurship uh, and uh, in a way that uh, you connect your experiences, which are the 90s and 2000s, they're pretty different than the experience nowadays. Yeah, cool, yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. But uh, can, you, can you make some kind of a parallel with, uh, with your uh, sporting activity, the marathon, and your running uh, of the company since 2005 or the 20 years of your professional experience. Can you make some similarities and try to make some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, assumptions how your business should be led? Well, definitely. Uh, even before I, I ran marathon, I was training rowing. Uh, yeah. So it's also a, another great sport for, uh, to be translated in, in business because you also need to be extremely persistent and teamwork is also extremely important in rowing and you, you also need to give your best and you never know what it's going to be like on, on the race. Uh, I do believe in the power of knowledge. I do believe that you can get lucky in business without knowledge and uh, there are some pretty successful business people that uh, actually brag about uh, the, the fact that they, didn't, they never read any business book. But there are also people that won the lottery. And there are people that won the lottery several times, <laughs> which is called luck, and that's okay. That, and uh, there might be some circumstances where you can only be persistent or have some kind of unique insight or some kind of other super talented skills to, to succeed. But I do believe in power knowledge and I believe that it greatly increases your chances of success. So when I prepared myself for the marathon, uh, actually that friend of mine that is a trainer, he had a really challenging task because I was in business and I'm sitting all day and I couldn't train as much as anyone suggests you should train for marathon. It was like half that training time. And I said, okay, I have half that training time and I have really ambitious goals and you should put those two together. <laughs> but I will honor the training plan. Okay. That's what, what I was going to do. And that's what I try to do in business. I have fairly ambitious goals and I have fairly limited resources. And, but I am willing to honor the strategy and the plan that we, that we agree on. And then we will execute on, on that plan and see what will, what will happen. But we will try to, to do it with as much knowledge and information and persistence that we can. But uh, is the knowledge uh, the goal itself, or did you have some other other ambitions? I would ask you, uh, what is your ambition uh, for the marathon? That would be like running less than four hours. But can you tell me what uh, and why did you started your business marathon and your company? So, <laughs> well, actually, I was uh, one story why I started my company. I told you. Uh, the, the, the trainings and the, that, that was the story. We want to hear but, the another part. But Why? Another, another thing was actually the uh, combination of several, several factors. One is that um, I left the Pristop, the, the company I mentioned, where I was director of clipping services. And I got my first business card with the title director on it when I was 24 years old. Uh, in a kind of multinational company. And then when I left it uh, at age 20, 27, uh, I was too young to be uh, at that level in a really multinational big company, corporation. And I was too experienced to work on a position that was more suitable for my age. So I was in kind of a limbo there. Okay. And uh, Actually, I also thought that if, uh, if my job is in marketing, sales, and business growth, and if my job is to make money, I might as well make that money for myself, not for other corporations. So I'm not afraid of working for myself, by myself, and trying to create something, because I believe in my abilities and my skills. And if I, I several times made question, 
do I believe more in myself or in like my superior or manager in some multinational company? Most of the time I believe more in myself because I know what I invested in, in my knowledge and in my development. So I want to, to work for myself. I wanted that kind of uh, space to do what I believe is right, to do what I want to do. And a big part of that is actually to choose what not to do. Because I sacrifice profit very often because I do not want to do things that are contrary to some of my values, that are not in areas that I'd like to do, that are some, that in any way inappropriate. In any way, I don't believe we should do it. We don't do it, no matter how profitable that business can be at, at that point. But uh, since you're sacrificing profit in, 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 in ways, um, did you had uh, times in your, your company that you were close to fail on some kind of failure? Several and times. Several times, yes. Can you share that those experiences <laughs> with us? Or was that living in the edge, <laughs> I would say? Because uh, that is the name of the company and has a different meaning. On, on <laughs> the right? edge of bankruptcy, yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, well, to be a very young company in 2008 at the outbreak of the world economic crisis it was a very challenging time because a couple of months before that we were actually 90% of our business at that time was like open and normal trainings. Like we announced the training and whoever wants to come they can pay the, the price, the, the ticket and they can, they, can, they can come and the companies paid for that a lot. One of the, uh, the first things that got slashed and annihilated when, when the crisis comes is training budget. Because people development can wait a year or two. Nobody will. <laughs> Nobody what to do it. with those yeah. people that didn't have training? And uh, there was a situation when uh, I, 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 at that time I, I had really close cooperation and worked a lot with uh, Hemofarm, or the largest pharmaceutical company in Serbia. And when a guy called me from Hemofarm and told me that all our plans for training series and everything had to be cancelled, because they stopped all external paintings in pharmaceutical industry. I said, okay, <laughs> oh shoot. <laughs> so that was really, really challenging and 2008, 9, 10th were really, really tough time that needed a really quick transformation, needed really, really for us to really think through our business model, what do we really want to do, where are we going to go and at the end, it, it turned out okay, but it very easily could turn out otherwise. <laughs> of course, like happy and and much. about meaning of edge, uh, aside from like edge of a blade and something that you can cut yourself on, uh, edge is also some uh, has meaning of advantage. Uh, so cutting edge meaning you are very advanced, very contemporary, very modern, and have latest and greatest whatever, knowledge, tools, methodologies, techniques, things like that. Okay, um, you can teach us those methodologies and techniques or share some experience with us because here are the entrepreneurs, people who want to learn, who know what the knowledge and the power of knowledge is. I assume that you are sharing that, sharing that on your website and possibly in your autobiography since you said that you were reading a lot of autobiographies, I expect one from you. Yeah, I, I still don't have patience to write those long forms, so <laughs> don't expect that too soon. But um, the mission of, of my company, Edge, is to help ambitious companies to achieve sustainable, profitable growth through or with our help with our latest knowledge, methodologies and tools. And the key word there is ambition and ambitious. And one friend of mine says that the largest issue with Serbian business is not that much lack of tools or money or resources, it's lack of ambition. Because at, at some point some people get uh, successful and they have apartment, car, beautiful wife, resources, enough money, family, enough money to travel, whatever they need and they do not have ambition to achieve more. They are satisfied and they say, okay, that's it for me and that's, that's enough. And a lot of domestic Serbian companies do not grow as much as they could because owners and managers do not have that ambition to grow, to conquer the world that, that many others have. And I really hope I like that spark of ambition in 
startups in modern startups and young tech companies that want to attack American market first and then be the place for this and that in, in the world and I, I believe that's in some way healthy. In other ways it could be really dangerous, but it's good to have ambition to, to grow and to, to really be successful. When you see on the borders of Serbia. Of course, of course. Serbia. When you say dangerous, those are those obstacles that every entrepreneur faces. And uh, do you have some advice for the entrepreneurs or have you seen some pattern in uh, those mistakes that entrepreneurs make? Well, advice is, is get prepared and try to plan as much as you, as you can. Of course, plans very seldom materialize in a way that you wanted them to materialize. And you, you think one thing will happen, but the other thing <coughs> actually does. But the process of planning actually does help you solve problems, help you react faster, he uh, help you be more flexible, help you understand situation from a helicopter view, from, from the bird's perspective, as they yes. say. So actually, this whole process of thinking through your business more deeply uh, can really help you at least avoid obstacles that were like avoidable or, or very obvious. So many people, their companies die from mistakes they could have avoided. And that's really, really big. Because they didn't have a training for they, the they didn't. They didn't have look forward enough. Yes. They didn't have bothered to look forward. But tell us please, uh, have you um, have a situation when you didn't look uh, far enough? And uh, looking from this perspective, would you do all the things the same? Well, th there is that saying, if I had that age in this season. So. <laughs> of course. There, there is actually a reason why you don't have that age <laughs> in this season. Uh, there was a situation, my favorite example is that 2008, when in May of 2008, I do strategic planning for, for Edge, and I decide to double down on open enrollment trainings. We'll do more of them, more often, more, more, more of those. Three months later, that business is completely dead, shut down. doesn't exist. As a market, not. So it was like we are really sprinting right into the wall. <laughs> so it hurt. <laughs> yeah, so those are the things, okay, I couldn't, or maybe I could, I know, couldn't foresee what will happen, but that's really, really good example of, of not seeing the, the future. There are other, other things, there are other times where we change direction as we, as we grow, because we started uh, Seven and the Adventure Forum as an event. But later on, uh, we decided to expand to, to donor-based projects of uh, entrepreneurial education and uh, trying to, to help young people to start all those companies that we need to showcase on the Adventure Forum, because we're really scared that someday investors will come, but we will not have enough pitching companies that would be not so nice situation. Or pitching in the right way. Whichever. The, about the right way, we do have uh, investor readiness trainings and we will, every pitching company that uh, that, that will uh, be on stage on Belgrade Venture Forum, they will have a month long uh, investor readiness online training that we will provide about how the pitching should look like, what the pitch deck should, what the content should be, what data you should show and things like that. And we will have kind of a dry run, mo mo uh, most probably. So about how that we can solve, but if there is no substance, that's, that's harder to solve for one company. It is actually, but um, can, you, can you say that knowledge in Serbia is now uh, easy, uh, easy acquirable? Or um, is there any ambition to acquire that? Is the lack of ambition to acquire that knowledge a problem? There is definitely lack of ambition, uh, disguise, there's lack of time. And uh, if, you are, if you are fluent in English and if you understand English well, then knowledge is really at your finger, fingertips. If not, then you are in a, in, in, in a problem because there is not so much of, of great information, great knowledge in, in Serbian, unfortunately. <coughs> not many great books in Serbian. Uh, most of the time, translations of, of business books to Serbian language are very poor because they're doing, they're done by general translators. They do not understand the, the business language, and there are really some funny examples of those. 
but uh, actually if people do want to learn uh, they can learn uh, there is another issue now we have too much knowledge so there is a, a needle in haystack problem so yes. where is that pearl of wisdom that is really really useful for me who should I follow who sh whose work should I read which books should I read and that's a kind of a different question and that's almost as dangerous as if there is not not any if there is not any okay you do not have access and then you have some access and that's great because everything you can consume you do but then when you have too much information what do you do then you can't possibly read anything learn anything watch anything everything and uh, then you have to choose and th there is a bit of a skill there as well but then reading autobiographies is actually a good way of uh, I actually finding. like them because they provide a window into the mind of those people and you can, if you, if, if you pay enough attention, you can see uh, how they think and their, their mental processes, their way of thinking, their way of coming to conclusions, their way of resolving problems. So some very, very great pearls of wisdom in, in, in those books, in, in a way of a single sentence maybe but very important and worth the money and time <coughs> of reading the whole book. So autobiographies, not biographies that, of course, in, because they can be sometimes great, sometimes not, but uh, autobiographies of famous people I do a lot to read, yeah. Yes. But uh, of course, uh, the reader shouldn't identify himself <laughs> with, a, with a writer, of course. So reading multiple biography, autobiographies would be a solution when you can find a lots of pearls of wisdom. Yeah, definitely. There, as, as many as you can. As many as you can. Of course, uh, listen to the experience of people on a startup grind would be also like autobiography, kind, kind in of short. <laughs> so people can gather some information, some pearls of wisdom throughout, throughout those. That's, that's why I also like to, to watch interviews. And one of uh, my favorite devices at, at my home now is Apple TV. Because when I bought that single piece of, of, of device that actually uh, enabled me to watch like YouTube in a very, very comfortable and convenient way. And after some time, YouTube can learn what you do want and what you don't want to watch. So not many kittens in my <laughs> suggested videos, but there are fantastic interviews, uh, fantastic conferences that, that are sold months in advance in, or, or years in advance. To, to mention TED or, or the conference or uh, some some of uh, some of those that have all their content available online. Actually, uh, most of Belgrade Venture Forum, uh, Belgrade Design Week lectures are on Vimeo channel of Belgrade Design Week, so you can watch those and. Uh, several lectures and pitches of Belgrade Venture Forum are also on our. Vimeo channel, so we do try to upload things we can. This is this is also a matter of time and resources and everything. But lots of great interviews, lots of great conferences that you can watch on your TV at your leisure TV time. So you can watch actually something really great on TV. TV is back again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's greatness. <laughs> TV bought TV with a choice. Actually, I, I, I bought a flat screen TV last year, first time in my life. So for 10 years, I had that big gray box that were just collecting dust. And I never watched it, except for some direct sports moments but now i do often watch tv i watch videos from ted from vimeo from youtube from other other sources on my big screen tv and that's fantastic i like it yes that's that's a way of uh that's a way of getting knowledge for you so um if, learning if i'm and enjoying learning and enjoying at the same, same time, time yeah. at the same time so um can i can i in a way in a way conclude that the knowledge is something that uh, all this talk was was about well, and learning as a final advice for our friends entrepreneurs I, I can be very comfortable with that conclusion yeah okay yeah okay. I, I do believe in knowledge and I believe to, to, to knowing as much as you can can really dramatically increase your, your chances of success yes there is one uh, quote I, I suppose that you will you'll say that it's not important how good you are but it's important how good you can be 
of course, and the knowledge and the persistence and the training is possibly the way to it. There is a, another quote of, of Mark Cuban, the famous US entrepreneur, that says, it's what success is all about, it's about the edge. Yes, <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Uh, this is, this is um, the final, final uh, of, the, of our startup ride. I would uh, ask you to ask confessions uh, if you would like. Uh, of course, afterwards you can speak with that as well. And of course, contact the Edge and the you know, Belgrade Venture Forum. Thank you very okay. much. Top three. Uh, Leah Yacocca's autobiography is great. Uh, Richard Branson, Losing My Virginity, which is actually a first autobiography, but it's a, it's a thick book. It's not a quick read. And, and I, I do like the, actually the, the Steve Jobs uh, biography. Actually, it's not autobiography, but is, it is kind of approved by him and he contributed to that book. He also he, he even invited Walter Isaacson to to write that book, so it is also a great book. It's also very very thick. But I actually another thing that I like about books is audiobooks. So anytime I am in anytime I'm in, in car, and if you're driving a lot through Belgrade, then you are bound to spend lots of time in your car. Uh, you can you can listen to audiobooks, to podcasts. There are some great podcasts. And you can find audiobooks even on or, 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 or Audible or otherwise. And there are there are some some great books that, that you that you should read. Other than that, I might recommend Blotion Strategy. I might recommend some Jim Collins books. Malcolm Gladwell's books are also great. They're not business books per se, but they, they have some really great conclusions. And other many other books we can talk about that for a long time. Uh, hello, I'm Nicola. Uh, how was your experience and relationship with uh, the ninth uh, gymnasium? Because uh, currently I'm uh, studying like uh, second uh, year in ninth gymnasium in yeah. New Belgrade. Well, uh, that is really. Uh, first of all, it's, it was really strange time. It was I was from 1992 to 1996 in that school, so that was 92nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th sanctions wars. It was really not some, something that you would call a normal situation. So this very much affected my experience, my school experience. It was dynamic and, and, and exciting, to, to say it this way. And uh, at that time, I'm not sure now, but at that time, it was one of the best schools in Belgrade. And I was very, very fortunate. It's, it's not that I'm so, so smart, so I chose the best schools, but I was very fortunate to go to best school since Belgrade and in Serbia at those times. And it was nine gymnasium, it was fun, and afterwards also Kutruli Business School. So it was a great school, it was, it was hard school, it was hard to, 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 to finish, to have good grades. But the matter of fact is that all of us that wanted to, to <coughs> enroll in the, the university, we did go to faculty, faculties that we wanted to. Which means, and we did did great in, in, in at those faculties. It was not really really hard. So I believe it was it was a good preparation and education. And I, I have uh, good feelings for, for that school. Okay, thank you. Questions? You mentioned startups tech in the American market. Excuse me. You mentioned startups tech in the American market. Okay. How do you think this process will be affected given that Trump won the elections? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't had much time to think about it. <laughs> when you mention Trump, um, how many of you have uh, uh, know about Dilbert comic? Yeah. <laughs> really few. Okay, Dilbert.com. So this is uh, the most famous comic in the world mocking business and business procedures and office situations and things like that. But the author of that comic, Mr. Scott Adams, is extremely smart guy. 
an extremely well educated guy with really great business education and he has a blog and at this blog he has really weird but genius ideas that he wants to communicate uh, with his audience and I was following that blog for, for a while and, and I will come back to your question and uh, at July last year at his blog so it was a year and a half uh, earlier uh, than, than now he uh, actually wrote a blog when he said this guy Donald Trump he has the best persuasion skills I have ever seen in my life and I'm trained hypnotist and I'm trained persuader and I know persuasion skills and this guy is out of charts. He will wipe out every and all of his opponents and he will win in a landslide. And he said in July of, that, of 2015. From that point on, up until to this day, every two or three days he wrote a blog post analyzing what's happening and which is the most important predicting what will happen so uh, his theory he says that any theory can be uh, true in hindsight in analyzing what happened but the quality of a theory is good as as much as that theory can predict future situations and he accurately predicted like demise of jeb bush carly purina many other opponents in Republican race, and then uh, he talked about the race with Hillary and how Hillary changed her strategy. And it's extremely interesting and extremely valuable read, so you do have it on, on his blog, although you should at this point read some hundred plus blog posts because it's a year and a half of constant blogging. But Trump's surprise was following all that. He's, he's, uh, his winning is not a big surprise. So actually he did say he will win and he said a couple of days ago that he will win in a landslide. I was like suspicious, but it turned out he's right, he was right. So it was kind of expected. And uh, because Trump is a very serious business person, he's like for 40 years he's in business. And in business you do not become successful by making erratic, irresponsible, wild decisions. So there is a very strong uh, theory by Mr. Adams that says that all that he did and said during the campaign was actually uh, thoughtful uh, persuasion. It was like uh, performance that was needed to be done in order for him to win but he will not make any, any big, drastic, erratic things. And I don't believe he will make business harder for business people from all over the world, including Serbia, which means I might imagine that, that it would be a bit the same or maybe a bit easier to... If America does great and if American economy continues to grow, then perhaps it would be easier because there will be more money for all kinds of services, including ours from this region. But we should have in mind that economic cycles in, in recent decades is kind of eight years. So it was a meltdown in 1992 and then 2000, 1999, 2000 and 2008. And surprise, surprise, we are now in 2016. <laughs> so it is like widely expected widely expected to, to have another down cycle or contraction or correction in economy as they, wa they want to say but we will see what, what will happen so if something not so fantastic happens to economy it might be to some natural economic cycles not that much to who is the president or something like that so I don't expect any, any big changes thank you very much I have a difficult question for you wow uh, what do you think in 20 years is and how technology is going to change political systems and democracy? Uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Actually, that's not something I gave great thought to, but uh, I believe that technology will become integral part of, of our lives and it will profoundly uh, influence any part of our life including society, organization, government, political systems, democracy, and, and things like that. 
So one thing I'm sure it will influence very much, but in which way? More likely in a way of, of more direct economy, uh, direct democracy, or any other way of, of of making political decisions. More likely in more transparent way, like what we are seeing now with uh, with Snowden, with WikiLeaks, with things like that. It's harder and harder to keep information secret with lots of people being involved and very easy to spread the word widely. So these are the trends that we can see now. Those trends can be actually fairly easily reverted if uh, internet service providers get greater power than they have now. Because when you look at it, very few internet service providers do control the whole internet, basically. You cannot have internet from Belgrade aside from like five or less <laughs> internet providers, really big ones. And if somehow they get greater power towards asymmetric internet on things like that, or things like that, that they, they would like to have naturally, then situation might change drastically. But as things stand now with the uh, <coughs> internet that is symmetric and like for, for all and everything is open and the same, so these are the trends that, that I can see at least. But I do not pretend that I can see future in 20 years in any way. So it's like, just, I'm, I'm old enough to remember 20 years ago. 20 years ago, and this one doesn't resemble very much <laughs> each other. So it's, it's, it's a great shift. Internet, mobile, computers, laptops, great, great shifts. I mean, I, I remember how excited I was to be able, through some telnet services, to, to have a chat with, with a guy in another city. It was like, a, wow, revolution. And now it's like normal. So it's it's very different world with it we live in. The, the, the very much global, very much connected. So I believe that's the trend that will continue. If some if something something great doesn't happen and something big and unexpected always happens, as as you can read in the Black Swan book, another book. So, so we should keep watching the Simpsons. Yeah. So we should keep watching the Simpsons. Yeah. <laughs> They are evergreen, yeah. More questions? Feel free. Okay. Uh, that's it then. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Thank you very much.